good to go denny thank you uh for uh taking the time welcome to the rut how are you good thank you for having me yeah i'm great thank you i'm really good really good had a little nap so i'm a proper recharge for this this interview we're talking on a wednesday your day off um what's been the day like for you today actually we had a training day today so because of this whole new covid and whole new season apparently to keep Obviously, the outbreaks like it happened last year yeah. to a minimum. We've all got to test. Every prem team has to test on a Tuesday now. So Monday and Tuesday is pretty much pointless to the team because we can't train. No. We can't do nothing because... It's recovery days, we, right? Pretty much. And so until you get a test of all negatives, we then can train. So today was our first like, proper day training in preparation for Northampton on Friday. So today, how, have you found, how have you found lockdown? Uh, to be fair, for us players, the first lockdown has been was quite the, the weird one because it went from playing to then having three months off. And then obviously we got, before everything was properly locked down, the club was been great. Everyone that needed a Watt bike got a Watt bike. Everything, everyone that needed like, you know, weights, had weights. So what you did had you the take? tools. <laughs> I didn't want to take nothing, but <laughs> yeah. um, I was forced to. I was forced to take a rock bike. Um, and then, so we did all these challenges just to try and keep fit. I was doing, you know, that 5K donation, uh, nominate five people mm. and donate five quid. Just anything to keep me, like, just occupied. But to be fair, me, I, I'm a home bird. Like, I love it. Oh, yeah. I love being home. Like, any chance I get, I want to be home. I want to be chilling and be relaxing. And my partner was heavily pregnant at the time. Mm. And so obviously we, we, you know, we couldn't get drunk on the Wednesday, just, just, just cause you could, <laughs> uh, but you know, it was monopoly countless amount of monopoly, um, you know, just little activities here and there, you know, and when we could, obviously there was like a period where you could have gone for one walk a day, we try and go for a walk. Obviously, she was pregnant, so it was kind of limited. But mm. yeah, block for the first lockdown was was all right. I, I didn't mind it. I think it was the back end, and then obviously this one. It's not really a lockdown for us. We train, we come home. We're going to play on wet on Friday. I think probably the only difference is there's literally nothing open. So, me personally, this lockdown's been not too bad, mate. I uh, I need to give a big shout out to Rob Shotton from Loose Heads because he did say if you don't give me a shout out on the podcast <laughs> with Denny he'll he'll string me up my by my bollocks yeah. so so yeah Rob is, uh, Rob big uh, yeah big uh, appreciation um for Rob Shotton who's introduced us um you've got an unbelievable story i don't know whether you fully appreciate it actually you probably do because you've lived it for 27 years but yeah. you, you you do have a fantastically um emotive story actually and one i'm very excited to dive into um i want to start by going back to exploring denny solomona as a kid growing up in new zealand from Everything that I've read, this schoolboy prodigy, and I suppose that's probably carried on into your league and union career. Um, what was what was life like for you growing up? Um, how, what was the relationship like with your parents, and and where did it all kind of start? Um, it started with just me wanting to play with my older brother, my older brother Ben at the time. Um, he's two years older than me, and then my dad obviously retiring from his rugby career, he wanted to just stay in rugby and he had obviously asked four boys to to have around and, and to train. And then unfortunately he chose Ben to as to coach his his year. So obviously two years older than me. And I was just like I was dead keen. I was like, well no, well why can't I why can't you coach me as well? Mm. He goes, no, because I coached the same year, oh, well, different year, but on the same night. So you're going to have to go and get coached by someone else. So 
I think for the first couple of years, maybe I, I think I did from five to like six or seven, I did. And then I think from six and seven, I was just like, dad, I don't like this. Um, I'm going off to my games. What did you, you like? Off to your... I, just, I think I just wanted to be coached by my dad on right. a Saturday. I'd go and play with my brother. You know, just have like, for me, yeah, it was yeah. just a, a fun. And I was just like, oh, dad, like, no, nah, I don't like it. I want to come get coached by you. And I want to come and like, obviously play with my brother. So he was like, yeah, fine. So that means you're going to come up and you're going to play two guys, two years above yourself. So you're going to have to like deal with that. I'm not going to go any softer on you than I am on, you know, my brother. And I think my dad created this, like this atmosphere with me and my brother and my dad as a, it was already professional. So when I got there, we, we obviously drove in the same car, going to training, going to games, but he never really was our dad as soon as we jumped off that, that car. So you did, you, did you like that or not? Yeah, well, I think, I think it just created that whole, like, especially because with parents and their kids, they're very protective, they're very opinionated. And if you go to go to a sport event, any kid's sport event, the dads are always like they're living their life through their kid and their little rugby game. Although the coaches um, obviously just put his hand up, said, yeah, I've got a bit of coaching experience. I've been a play, bit of rugby, so <laughs> yeah. I can coach. My so dad that's what my dad same, did. Yeah. <laughs> and people don't realize every person involved in a, in a little a year eight game is all volunteers. Mm. But supporters they they have no idea so obviously us being his sons and him being a coach we didn't he didn't want them to feel like he took any favorites so he picked it if we played well he picked us if we trained well he picked us if we didn't he dropped us and it was just simple and that's what kind of created for me so unless I was training well and playing well I can't play with my brother I can't mm. get coached by my dad so luckily, we let our rugby speak for itself and we ended up playing well together and my dad just kept picking us. And we had a um, pretty good team. I've got, I'm still really good mates with, obviously, the, really? the year group that I was with. We had a, a girl prop as well called Sina Poaching. She ended up wow. going to play for the women's uh, New Zealand team. Nice. Um, so yeah, we, we, I've kept in really good touch with, with, with most of the, the kids I used to play with. And they, they obviously went off to play some pretty decent rugby in their life as mm. well. So, um, so it's just to be fortunate enough to, to, to get, yeah, get play, uh, get trained by my dad and play with my brother. You got so, your yeah, first, that's... you got your first pro contract at 15, which yeah. for, for anybody, it like this, it's a meteoric rise, right? It's not, it's, that's not your normal. Well, at the moment, yes, it is. Okay, academy kids come through, they get picked up early doors. But do you know what? That's more football um, orientated. Now, yeah. you've actually said that other people, and I'm quoting you here, uh, other yeah. people wanted me to be a rugby player. What did you want to be? Well, that's the thing. I grew up rugby, sport, athletics anything I could could have got my hands on physically, that's all I knew. And because I knew I was good at it, I didn't look anywhere else. Right. That, that, was, that, was my, that was my thing. And I'm not saying it's my mom or my dad's fault. I think it was, it should have been something there to at least help me with something else. What was my passion other than rugby? What, what do you think I your was, passion was other than rugby? Or have you got no idea? Mate, what well, did you enjoy about now? Then, 15 years old? Back then, literally, you know, what every other 15 year old was just playing yeah. games, uh, PlayStation, girls. yeah, <laughs> girls. Uh, uh, my missus thinks, uh, thinks that my brother was the stud muffin. I was just the nerdy brother that just really came along. But obviously, you know, we'll leave it there. But <laughs> I, know, I was, I was the stud back then, but no. Um, to be fair, I, if I was to go back, I probably wouldn't know. I, I did enjoy like carpentry, so like obviously getting my hands on like a bit of. I don't know. Like, see, that's the thing. I I wouldn't know because I didn't really try nothing else. Mm. I just went to school for the sake of going to school because I right. couldn't drop out. I had to go to school. Um, 
So I went, ended up going to primary school, literally around the corner from my grandma's house. So we used to like go go from a grandma's house into primary school. And nice. primary school was great. I had a teacher that still smacked me because my grandma said it was allowed. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's crazy. So my grandma took me into school one day and obviously the teacher was in the same ethnic background as myself and my parents and my family. So she told her in Samoan, if he's ever naughty, give him a smack. Deal so obviously him, yeah. my, the, the teacher was like, yeah, I will. So <laughs> I, never st- I never stood a foot out of line with that teacher because I knew she was going to smack me. Really? Um, and I knew she was allowed. So uh, yeah, no. And then intermediate, I went to Papatoli High, uh, Papatoli Intermediate School. And then I went to college at Odahu College first. And then so that my older sister was at the, was there at the time and my older brother and it was kind of around that age where I kind of knew where I was going to go in life and I knew rugby was was probably my my path but it sounds and, like it's what I'm trying to understand here Danny is it sounds like okay you've got your first pro contract at 15 and then from reading in between the lines when you talk about other people wanted me to be a rugby player Mm. it sounds like you weren't sure you knew you were fucking good at it but you weren't yeah. you weren't really understanding of probably what it takes so from the age of up to 15 years old i, I imagine you're like a happy-go-lucky schoolboy who's just scoring loads of tries for fun and, and basically yeah. just living the dream and then you get to 16 and you start drinking yeah pretty much so i like, what was the drink for I, you then what where did this all where did where did the pine of path split i suppose roughly just in the same year so i think everything so i got a offer to sign with the auckland blues at the time really at 50 yeah so and i was like me and my dad i was like yes i finally like made it a kid that's come from you know a three bedroom house with only one bathroom with like what is it five of us seven seven or eight people Wow. So to three rooms. So my mum and dad obviously got the one. My two girls got the two sisters had the one. And then all us boys were in the other. And it's to have something like that at that age and realise that I can finally provide for my family. And it was just a dream come true. So I was like, yes, I can't wait. Then some reason they just didn't get back. And then Melbourne Storm came. And Melbourne Storm was like, look, like we, we, you know, we're going to be happy to 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 sign you. What we want to do is obviously we'll bring you over and do pre seasons with us first before you come over at, at the age of eighteen. So I was like, okay. So I was like, cool, that's fine. So I started doing that, and obviously, at a, as a 15, 16 year old, you get this persona of like, oh, you you're going to be the you're going to be the man, you're going to be the best. So obviously I, I lived up to it and I was just like, oh, okay, yeah. Like as a 15, 16 year old, if you are surrounded by everyone that loves you, everyone that wants to be you, you end up having this cockiness about you. Like, oh yeah, I'm the, I'm the fucking man, like, I, you know? So I bought into it. Well, hook, line and sinker, I, I fell for it. I fell for the whole lifestyle of, yeah, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. And like you said, the, the timeline is is very blurred for me because from 15 to like now, it's still very blurred. And that's why I'm kind of erratic with my timelines because it was just, it's a massive blur. And obviously drinking, it was just the pressure of it. Right, okay. I think at the time I knew I was going to be the professional athlete that's going to provide for my family. So that, that pressure came upon me mm. where I think my older sister now kind of appreciates oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> kind of appreciates like the the pressure I had because my sister had to drop out and start school I uh, start work early to kind of help out with that kind of situation so now my sister kind of like understood of the pressure that I was kind of feeling because she was feeling that as well can you remember? So, can you remember like going back to like being? I appreciate it's kind of blurry, but I just it'd be quite interesting to explore. Like, what was drinking for you back then? Um, 
like how did it affect your state because i can imagine it's quite confusing you're about to you're about to sign or you've signed for melbourne storm right and yeah mm. you're 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 drinking heavily because the pressure of of basically life providing for your family and the the um the trials and tribulations of being a professional um but can you remember what what was going through your mind at the time at the time i thought i was being just a rebel i really? thought i was rebelling against my parents because obviously they're strict they're like look you mm. can't go out you can't do this you can't do that and i just thought i was just being a rebel and when you're like obviously when you're rebelling against your parents you you, you do them things but looking back at it i wasn't just doing it for fun i was getting like alcohol poisoning because i was drinking that much or drinking that stupidly and because I was drinking, I had this whole alter ego when I drunk, I started getting really aggressive with everyone. So everyone right. around me, I'll, they'll look at me and I'll just like, what, the, what, what are you looking at? Why are you looking at me? Paranoia, it was just like, it was just, mm. I didn't know why I was like that. And it was crazy. And then because I started drinking, it kind of made me feel, because I blacked out, it was like, oh, okay, that, that, that was kind of, I kind of forgot about the pressure yeah, that I was, done done I was under. So I was like, that, that, obviously it hurt the next day because you're just throwing up for the rest of the, like for two yeah. days after because you had alcohol poisoning. But at the same time, I would rather throw up and, you know, and not feel the, the way I was feeling, the pressures that I was under than to not drink at all. So mm. that was the reason why I started. But obviously at the time, I didn't know it. I just thought I was just being a, you know, a stupid 16 year old that was just, you know, having the drink and sneaking out. And I was just lucky enough that my cousins were old. So like, well, old enough, like I think 22, 23 at the time. So they had their own place and, you know, I could safely go and drink with them. Right. So that for me that that was a good scenario so i was obviously in a safe environment where i couldn't go off and get lost somewhere and so i just let myself go there and for some reason they just kept having me back so i was like oh cool <laughs> and um so yeah then it like went quiet for a bit so for like two years so from 16 17 18 mm. it was like a bit of a chill period like i knew obviously i needed to train well i needed to play hard because I need to get into this first first grade team. So at the time when I signed my first contract at 15, it was for the under 18s. So Melbourne brought me over and I was like, look, like I'm ready to come out, like move over. My mom got made redundant when I was 17, 16, around that time. So did that have like, an effect on you? Did it put even more pressure on you financially? Um, looking back at it, I I, I didn't think it did because my mom and that when my mom got made redundant, they had a big page paycheck. So basically they paid right. off all the yeah. debt that they're yeah. under. So I think for me, for that period, they're free. They're like, we've got no debt. We've got no nothing. All we need to do is pay for this, the mortgage that we had on the house. Mm. And so they, they were fine. So we we're like, okay, cool. So me and my mom decided to move over first whilst my dad stayed there and saved up a bit more money to come over. And this is- Move to Australia. To, yeah, to move to yeah, Melbourne. Yeah. So we, I called the general manager, Frank Panisi at the time. And I was like, look, I know that you guys only want me when I'm 18 to play for the under 18s. And because in the times before, like obviously 16, 17, 18, they brought me over to do a pre-season with them. Mm. So I was doing pre-seasons with them and I was obviously getting involved and getting comfortable with, with, with their culture. And I'm, he was like, look, if you guys are willing to do it, we'll bring you over. We can, you know, you can either start playing for the under 18s at 17 if you want and we'll go from there. And I was like, yeah, cool. So it started from camps, going over for pre-season camps, going over for trials, etc., And then it went from actually moving and it was all well and good, but it was like, it was very daunting for me to move into a whole new country, a whole new place, mm -hmm. make a whole new friends. And I knew at the time that obviously I just had sport. My younger brother and sister were still in school. So I spoke with my mom and I was like, look, like we need to try and get him into a good school here. 
so that obviously they can actually do well in school. The school we went to was a public school that you know everyone enrolls to around the around the, the area, and everyone that probably goes there knows that it wasn't the best school for academics. Like, and I knew my sister, my little brother. I needed to break that cycle of just going to school, finishing your year, and then not knowing what to do. So we moved over, my little brother and little sister, I ended up having to enroll into the school because they wouldn't have my little brother and sister without me going to the school. Mm. So it ended up being Glen Waverley in, uh, in Waverley, um, you know, in, um, in Melbourne. We went and enrolled my little sister at the time. So my little brother was still going to like a primary school and intermediate before getting into the school. So they were like, look, uh, my little brother's not at the age, but we want to enroll him later. They're like, no, that's fine. Denny's come here. So you guys are obviously the family. So you guys have come. And luckily my sister made a great impression on the, the high school there that she ended up obviously taking over my, my reputation and being like, oh, George, are you George's little brother? Instead of, oh, you, you guys are Denny's little sister and brother. Mm. So, because I didn't, like, I didn't like school. I had to, so under 18s, we had to train at six o'clock in the morning, then catch a train back. And this was a sacrifice we all had to make. Every part of that 18 crew that we had, had to wake up at, you know, two, two o'clock, three o'clock, depending on where you lived. And most, some, some of the boys lived even further from me. And I don't know if you know him now, but Mahe Fanua, Mm -hmm. Kenny Bromwich. So all yeah. of them were all in the, the, the 18s, 20s at the time. And that was the kind of the exact same example that you had to go in beforehand and go and after. And um, so when I was still in school, I had to go to training. Six o'clock could be a wait. Depending on the, the temperature of the day, they'll either flip fitness and all your skill work in the afternoon to the morning so that when you come back in the afternoon, if it's you know 35, 36 degrees, you can still go and train because you're doing all your outdoor work in, in the cold in the morning. So then we'll then have to go back, catch a train back home, try and get changed, try and get ready, go to school, finish school from three o'clock, then training will start at five, 6.30 in the afternoon. So you have to travel from Glen Waverley to all the way into to Richmond, which was where Storm's training ground is. And so that happened for a couple of years. And obviously everything in between was just, was great. I had my mind. And, and mentally, my... mentally at this stage, like it sounds like you were just kind of getting on with it, right? It was this, yeah. okay, yeah, we've come over to Melbourne. I'm, I'm continuing to live the dream. There is still the... Yeah the sort of pressure on you to, uh, I suppose, be a success given actually, do you know what? Yeah. Your parents and your family have given up a huge amount to come and move over to, to, the, to Australia. Um, did that ever dawn at you at any stage? Yeah, of course. Like, obviously I was the reason why they moved. Yeah. Uh, if, if I didn't have a contract to move to Melbourne, I don't think any of them would have come. I don't think they would have made a, made a solid decision to be like, look, I think we should move to Australia because I don't mm. think it was ever on the table. So, yeah, it was just... How did you struggle with identity at that stage? It's because that's all, all who I was. Really? I was this guy that woke up at two o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I caught a ride off my dad. Sometimes I had to catch a taxi to the train station. Um, so it was lucky that my dad worked at the airport at the time because the airport's like literally the other side of, of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So you either sometimes drop me off or drop me just to the train station or drop me, you know, just right outside the door. Or I'll have to catch a taxi in the morning and get there on the train station. If I missed that train station by a minute, I would have been late completely. Or if I caught the one earlier, I'll be there. Like, I think it was the first train actually to move, leave Glen Waverley train station. So, I think with, with identity, it was just because I was surrounded by rugby from a young age, going up, not finding a different hobby. If I found, maybe if I found a different hobby or a different group of friends that was nowhere near involved with rugby, 
I may have found something else and I may have found a different identity that other than a rugby player. And I feel like that's because I was so consumed into this role of either being the provider for my family, paying the rent that we're, we're, we're the house that we're in and obviously being the success story that coming out from, you know, South Auckland where we grew up with to, to, to making something out of nothing. Yeah, to next to nothing. Yeah. For yeah. And, so that was my identity struggle was because I didn't find anything else other than rugby. And did because you, did you, of, did you, Denny Solomona, did you want to be a rugby player or not? Yeah, of course yeah. I did. But then it was at the point where I fell out of love with the, with the game. And mm. it was, it was very quick as well. I think from when I was, when I started playing twenties, I was already training with, the, the first team and so when I played so obviously we had a full-time contract with the first grade team but I still played with the 20s and I never had another job so I, some of the 20s boys that trained with the first grade team that were like fortunate enough to play and train with them they still had to go to work so they and then my role was an apprenticeship so basically I had to clean you know, protein shakers, clean up after the training session, uh, set up training. So me setting up training, you can imagine like Mel Melbourne Storm is the, probably the hardest pre-seasons I've ever done in my life. Really? And I think they pride themselves on, you know, training really hard, getting mentally strong. And then anything that you face in season is pretty much nothing compared to pre-season. So imagine me as an 18 year old setting up these hard hill sessions and these 2.3 K time trials, knowing fully well, I'm walking around setting up cones, knowing full well in an hour, I'm going to be hurting and running around the yeah. things that I've set up. So it was, it was, a, it was a great experience, but I took it for granted. I was just, cause I was always around the first grade boys. I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously there, I'm, yeah. I'm the man. Yeah. And then I got injured. I broke my leg back in my hometown, New Zealand, playing the New Zealand Warriors in, in, in 20s. And then from there, I think it just kind of like, it, injury kind of just set my mind like a bit wobbly. I was like, do I actually enjoy this game? Do I love it that much to rehab on your own, wake up before everyone else and rehab, do all of this? I was like, for me personally, it wasn't for me. I hated rehab. Really? I hated because I was because anyone that plays professional sport in a, especially a team sport, rehab's a very lonely place, mentally and physically. I had Jack Willis it, and James Gaskell on the pod recently, yeah. and it yeah, it sounds like a savage place. It, it, and obviously, you as me as a twenty-year-old, uh, nineteen, I think I was at the time always at the fringe of making his first grade appearance to getting injured and not fully recovering from that injury mentally and physically. It was, it was damaging for me because really? it can't, and my ego, especially my ego, because I was this next Billy Slater because I was, I was full back at the time and Billy Slater was in his prime playing Queensland, playing state of origin, playing Australia and then literally backing it up on the same week and playing for club. Mm. So I was expected to play and, you know, jump into his boots every now and then when he was, when he was not wanting to play because he's backed up on the Monday. So I was this next big protege of the next Billy Slater. And I was, I was coming up with Cameron Munster at the time that plays with for Melbourne Storm now mm. and Christian Welsh as well. That, that's a prop for Melbourne. So it was all my 20s crew and seeing Cameron Munster and all of that thrive now, it, I regret obviously not trying to put in a bit more. But at the time, it was just, for me, I was just like, I'm the next big thing. I deserve this. But mm. why? Why did I deserve it? I just never found the answer. Mm. How, do you, how, how do you describe your ego? It was, well, at the time. Well, just in, well, yeah, okay, yeah. Take, yeah, at the time, like, um, what was your relationship like with it? 
Because I it find was... ego, just to give you context, like, I find ego fascinating. It can be the killer or of some people. It can, sorry, it can be the death of some people, but also it can be the the one thing that drives people. And ego, yeah. I don't know if you've read Ryan Holiday's, like, um, ego is the enemy. Um, yeah. It's a super interesting topic. And it's yeah. Um, for, yeah, I, I just, what, what, what's your. Yeah, we can, we can dive deeper like, if you want. Yeah, go on. Well, what's your relationship like with the, the ego? My relationship with my ego now is obviously a lot better than it was. Of course, yeah. Ego, as you say, is either can be the death or can be the drive. My one was definitely the death. Mm. Um, I think it's what drove me to be, in, drove me into that hole because I expected the world, because I was guaranteed the world. Mm. So why do I expect the world? And then, so this ego was like building up, building up throughout my, you know, 15, 16 year old to then my 20 year old. And as a 20 year old, you're like, why, why am I not starting it? Why haven't you given me a go? And I never understood why I did it. And then because I wasn't willing to listen to the answer to understand it, I was listening just to reply. So then again, you just not, no information was coming in. Everything was going out into the world. And then I kind of just got sick of it. And I was just like, look, I'm like, basically, fuck it. So I started drinking more. And then it was kind of around Melbourne area where I, Melbourne time where it kind of broke me to the point where I started, I found out about it, this drug called cocaine. <laughs> and obviously, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and obviously, like, you know, MND, you know, ketamine, all yeah, of this yeah. sort of stuff. And I, I just found, found all of this out in Melbourne because I was looking for an escape to stop feeling this, I feeling like I've been betray, uh, betrayed by the club that was supposed to give me everything. But why? That's but in what way? Because that's interesting because like, you've had an injury, exactly. right? Like, yeah. Why, why should they? No, because but it's like a clash of, of, clash of egos, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Just because I, I signed at 15 and I was in the round since I was 15, just because of that, like, no way. Like me, if I was to go back and be like, bro, just be patient, keep working yeah, yeah. hard, keep your head to the floor, your bum up, just keep one step at a time. Don't worry. But as a 20 year old with the ego, the size of the planet, it, it was never, it was never going to happen. It was never going to be a, a good yeah. scenario. And that's what kind of brought me to the point of where back to the identity is like, well, what do I, what else do I have? I've got nothing else. So I'm no. just going to have to just deal with it. So I dealt with drink, it the best drink way and I could, sniff it away, drink yeah. and sniff it. And, yeah. and it never really kind of left that whole behavior and the whole kind of, it was kind of a habit. It was kind of an autopilot of if I was feeling stressed or feeling a bit anxious about anything, I would drink. And mm. because coming up to my 20 year old, I was then told, I was like, look, your agent wants to have a word with you. We want to have a word with you, Melbourne, this is Melbourne. Um, I think it's great if you can go off to Europe and play against men and have a bit of experience. And at the time, I was like, okay, so basically this is a loan deal. They're like, yeah, so you're going to go for a year, come back, and hopefully the experience will do you good. What were your thoughts on that, given what we've just spoken about? <laughs> for some reason, I accepted it. Really? I don't know why. I, I should have said, no, I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to graft, and I'll, 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 I won my shot at, at big time at, at my first great appearance. And at the time, I was just young and stupid. They'd never given me a go. I thought it was a personal attack on me. So I said, fuck it. I said, yeah, okay, I'm going to go. So I went. And, and it was and, and what was it, 2014, 15, maybe? Yeah, I think around that time. So sorry, my memory sorry, is obviously horrible. We got pumped every game, sixty points to. This is know, the London 15, Broncos, 60, right? Sixty points to twenty. Yeah. Yeah, you should never and have been in as the a twenty-year-old that was drinking. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine drinking, drugs, everything, and then going into the big smoke. 
a town that never sleeps. Um, it was probably <laughs> the worst idea that I've ever had. But my family had no idea. My family just thought I was a young guy, had a lot of, had, had all this money, and I could just go and do whatever I wanted. I went and drunk. And the drugs they didn't even come up until I got fired from London Broncos. So it was at the time where London Broncos were losing every week. I was miserable. It was winter. It was my first like full experience of England. And obviously in winter in, in England, it's dark at three. And between probably nine o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon, that's the only sunlight you're going to have. So you're in, indoors in London. And to be fair, luckily, I did have some good roommates, which was Til, uh, Tel Aviv and Nesiasi Matai Tonga, which is two islanders. So it was kind of like a home away from home because I had similar cultures, they're a Tongan. And they they also like to drink. So I was like, yeah, sweet, like, this, this is great. It's like having my, my cousin. So we, we ended up just drinking, having fun. We, I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed meeting, obviously, the, the lads and, and having the experience of obviously moving halfway around the world. But to not have my family as that safety net, mm. as what was spoken before, I used to go to my cousins at that safety net of getting as loose as I wanted, but my cousins were already there, so they'll look after me. I had none of that, no safety nets, no, no, no handcuffs, no one hand behind my back. I had two hands on my, my loose steering wheel, and I fully driven it off the cliff. <laughs> so... It was that's a really nice yeah, way of putting it, was, it, actually. Yeah, so basically, really nice you know, I always had that assisted, you know, one hand that always, <laughs> hey, yeah. bro, you, 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 you're going a bit to more the right, you need to stay in the middle. Your Tesla, I didn't have up. that, yeah, <laughs> fucked it up. Uh, so basically, I just had a whole control of my life. So, so we well, I mean, how long were you at London Broncos for? It's like. It, it was like a, a year, year. So only, yeah, and then you moved to Castleford, and so through yeah. London Broncos, you're getting on the piss and sniffing again. Yeah. Um, well, generally speaking, with athletes or people who use alcohol and and drugs, is almost like a bit of an emotional crutch. It's their kind of go-to when things are shit. Yeah. There's this. There's this under like underbelly feeling or cycle within themselves of like self-loathing, like self-hatred, like, Oh, you're such a fucking prick. Right. Let's just go and let's go and do two grams or whatever, or, or or get a bottle of vodka in. Like it was, was that the type of relationship you were also having with yourself? Was there self-loathing, like complete hatred? Yeah. And like I said, it all boils down to like, I didn't know who I was. Like, yeah comes down to his identity that, again yeah. it's just that's the whole underbelly of my whole depression is this whole identity and that's the only bet that's the best way i can explain it is this underbelly of the way i was feeling this 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 feeling was because who actually am i if i was just to, like like i said in my interview before if i was to die i was all i'll be known for is <laughs> i was just a rugby player yeah you know obviously and a, and a son and a brother but who actually am I? Am I, you know, I'm nothing else other than a rugby player. And yeah, and that's what kind of got me. Um, my first year, if you wanted me to continue, my first year at Castleford, yeah, I it. ended up, I was probably the most injury prone of my career. I think I was doing hamstrings. I did my PCL. I did my, my syndesmosis at the time. Mm. So injury prone first year and I was like what the fuck's going on here like I was like okay well what am I doing so I started drinking more yeah because we already know that rehab you fucking hate rehab yeah Uh, and (laughs) you know I wouldn't turn up for my rehab I'll just be like no I can't be asked today I'm I'm literally not gonna go I'll turn up to training he'll try and get me into the rehab room and I'll just be like no I can't I, I need to go and sit outside and just look at the boys whilst they train but obviously physios being what they need to do, they're like, look, okay, we'll open the doors, we'll open the windows, we'll put all the gear outside, we'll try and make you as involved as we can. And it's like, yeah, thanks, mate. So they they compromised with me and that's what kind of got me through a bit of it. But majority of it, I was back within probably a month before I should 
with any injury that I had. My PCL, you could you could play straight away, so I wasn't really bothered with that. But my syndesmos, my right ankle at the time, I just I I still couldn't walk, like probably walk on it properly. But I was like, look, just jab me up, put some a local anaesthetic in it, strap it, and I'll just play because I can't deal with it. I can't face the demons alone because when I do face my demons, it's either I just drink it away or I sniff it away. So that's how I dealt with it at the time, and. Then, at, like throughout that period, it was like just multiple times of just trying to drink it, sniff it, and then there was a time and, where luck. Sorry, and I, I just I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated by this because it's it's super interesting. When, okay, let's say you finished, uh, like you you've played for Castleford, you've or you've finished training, right, and um, or you finished rehab. And you're, you've gone home and you've got, got a bottle or, or a couple of lines and like you've done them. What was the aftermath like the next day? Did, Cause I can imagine you, was there any regret from your side? Were, were you thinking, fuck, I shouldn't have done that. Or was it just, do you know what? Fuck this. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, literally I couldn't give a fuck. Really? No, I was just, I wake up, I just like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm a bit hungover. I'm, I'm all right, I'll take a couple of paracetamol, so I'll drive to training. And, and it was just a constant repeat. Drive to training, did your teammates finish. know? No, it's because I did it, like I said, I was doing it at home. One, one Tuesday night, a right. couple of bottles of red. Christ. And I'll, sn- and I'll, you know, I'll sniff, and then I'll just keep going. I'll just keep drinking. At a time, I was single as well. And obviously, it was just... Bad, it's a bad time for me, and, I, and I, when I remember course, it, it's just it's it's very horrible for me that for me to have done all these things, and it was just it's crazy. I was either drinking, sniffing, or sleeping with someone, mm. and from a small town, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy, and um, so yeah, it was it was a constant on repeat. It was the same story, same day, different day. I'm oh, sorry, and um, it was just like that and then I was I wouldn't say my my ex was the reason why I had such a good year it was only because she just put she just basically gave it was like the way of the universe giving me a heads up being like she book she came into my life being like hey bro like you know you kind of got to sort your shit out yeah or basically do one go back home so it wasn't she sounds like, like a bit of a godsend, to be honest. It, at the time, but that's the thing. At the time, so let's 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 just fast forward for a second. So Ollie, the guy at Save Your World, if you look him up, Save Your World, he's he's done a lot with me in the last. Who was Save Your World? Before sorry? I met uh, Ollie. He, no, who who was Save Your World? Uh, so it's a it's a it's a group. So a group of us lads that kind of buy into this whole. Um, higher purpose universe right yeah uh, yeah sure ego okay. so you, you're getting more in touch with, with nice. your with all that side of things with basically true self down yeah. the rabbit hole yeah yeah and um so we when i moved to sale i think two years after last year actually that he kind of i've not cried like that with the guy with another guy ever in my life what but spot so there, what sparked that conversation because so, uh, to be honest, in the in like chronologically speaking, in the timeline, you've you've had this unbelievable season at Castleford where you've broken every single record in Super League history yeah. in terms of try scoring, and yet you were in one of the worst places imaginable yeah. mentally, which yeah. is just amazing. Um, yeah. And and then you meet your ex-wife. Yeah. And this, and, it's almost like they like the kind of heavens open for a second and this, yeah. this beam of light shone on her. And in a yeah. very good way, it sounds like she was a good person for you at the time. Um, and we can get on to, oh, don't have to get on to that much. Yeah, but, no, um, no, we, we definitely can. Yeah. And so she, you've, is, you've, you're still at Castleford when you've met her, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, so with our relationship, I missed How did you meet her love. first and foremost? Uh, uh, so it was a it was a friend of mine. So she, he lives down in London, and his partner was friends with her. Right, we kind so. of like went from there, and then 
it started from obviously a, a cheeky DM, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. sitting there. And then for for me personally, I think I'm mistaken gratitude with love. So because That's she came at the time, so interesting. Yeah. So this whole time, you know, I was grateful, and I and I, I mistaken that gratefulness for coming in and you know trying to just help me out, help me out, just trying to set me straight. And just basically like we were saying, if we want to use the analogy, help me with that steering wheel back into the middle. So I've gone too far right. I'm mistaking it for love. And it just went on and went on and went on. And then I kind of didn't realize it till it was too late. And this too late was obviously me cheating on her. And I didn't realize that gratefulness can kind of manipulate itself as a feeling of love. And yeah, only unless only until I spoke with Ollie and his obviously is if you want to go after this is Instagram save your world. He kind of put in perspective of the way I was feeling throughout the relationship is because I felt like I had something to repay to her. But I felt like my life was just I need to repay this woman back. So you're going to be my wife. You, you know, that's, that's simple. I Repay her because know, she's been so kind yeah, as to pick you up off she, the floor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was there when I was at my lowest and she picked me up and she helped me. And that's what I mistaken it for. And, you know, I can't knock her off. She was, she was, you know, she was a great girl. And obviously I treated her horribly. And, but then it just, it just wasn't for me. I think it was, when the bad times were bad, it was it was horrible. Yeah, I can imagine. And you can imagine like all these in tune people now, they can call it a toxic relationship. And at some points it was, even when it was good, sometimes it would be toxic. Sometimes, you know, it'll be good. And that's where it kind of was at for a long period of time. And obviously she was in this limelight of, a reality reality TV star. I was just this guy that wanted to play rugby and chase a pill around for a living. From South Auckland. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, it was crazy. Like when I first met her, I, like again, I fully bought into her lifestyle. Like all these cameras were taking photos, and I was just like, oh. Did you enjoy I'm it, man? Yeah. Well, my ego, ego, ego my speaking. Ego yeah, yeah. So now, resurrection of my my stupid ego came out and just like yeah bro i love this one like let's let's get it let's ride this wave let's take it um and then it was just from there she wanted to do like she wanted to have more so the only income she can have is obviously more tv shows of course yeah and the only tv shows because she first aired on x on the beach is that's where like she was known from so then again she was like oh I've, I'm, I'm going to bring out this this uh, active wear, this gym gym wear. The only way I can get it on is if I go on X on the beach. But the only way I can go on X on the beach if it's a, if if I'm single. So I was like, well, we're married, you can't. And then she's like, no, 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 okay, but don't worry, like I'm going to be faithful, but I just need to pretend like we're single. So her agent at the time was like, no, De- no, Jess, you can't be with Denny at all. So we pretended to be single throughout the whole basically marriage of our life. How did that make you feel? Obviously horrible because in our whole life was basically hidden from everything. And for me personally, like at the time, like I was talking about ego, like my ego wanted to be out there. He wanted to be like, no, let's go be shown together. So I'm, so I can read myself in the newspaper the next day. That's what I wanted. But as a relationship point of view, I didn't want it at all. I was like, no, like, we're married. If you can't go get on anything, if, if, if you're married, then what's the point? You like, might as well just split. And then she was like, no, 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 no. Like, this is, this is the only way I can get money. Like, I need to do it. And I was like, I was like, fuck. Okay, fine. Like, don't worry, you just do it. So she went on X on the beach and she was gone for a while. And obviously me being alone and me having a, a, a previous to just getting off the rails, it kind of broke me because I was like, she, it was almost like she was my, 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 uh, my comfort zone. 
So yeah. I knew if she was there, I won't do anything of that. And mm. because she wasn't, I was just like, oh, well, fuck it. I'm just going to drink. So obviously the drug stopped when I moved to sale, and that's when I met her was because it was that period of moving to sale after that good year I had. So with sale, I've ended up finding out these things called sleepers, and they're called um, tremadol and oh, diazepams yeah. and <laughs> muscle relaxants and yeah. all of these things. So I was taking, you know, three or four tremadols, three or four um, diazepams, and, and a couple of bottles of red wine. And you've you've told you've spoken about how good Steve Diamond's been since you've yeah, been mate, in sale. And like I said, I'm grateful for him. And obviously now I know, obviously I yeah. don't love the guy. You know, <laughs> but I'm you're not going to ask him to marry you. He'd probably turn around yeah, and say, fuck off. Exactly. <laughs> He'd probably chin me. Uh, yeah. but, you know, and I'm grateful for the bloke. Like He's done so much for me. Um, he gets he a bad rap, me. actually, Steve Diamond, in many senses. Yeah, I think it's because he speaks his mind. He speaks he does, yeah. to what, like he's not filtered. Uh, no, he's, he's confrontational not, as well. Exactly. And I think that's the reason why is because no one likes confrontation. And if you're seen being confrontational, you, you're labeled as a dick. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. he's labeled as it. But if you really get to know Steve, he's, he's a great dude. Um, and he's very understandable. He's He understood my situation and he understood even before I moved, I said, look, mate, I struggle with my mental health. Um, so this whole scenario I'm not going to be comfortable with. And he's like, Steve being Steve, he goes, fuck it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to look after you. You, you just do what I tell you to do and you'll be okay. So he gives me the sale sharks, man, to move all my shit from Castleford to, to say uh, to really? Warrington, the way I live now. And I, he knew what was going to happen because it's got, Sail Sharks logo on the side of the van <laughs> parked outside my house, moving stuff. So everyone's <laughs> like, everyone's like, what the hell is Denny doing? Like, what, where is he going? And obviously, Sail Sharks logo shark is literally plastered to see on everyone's face. Because obviously, you leave Castleford in a slight, in a bit of a cloud of, um, in a bit yeah. of an infamous cloud of smoke right like it was uh yeah. obviously the ensuing court case which happened and but it, it seemed like the right move for you at the time i mean at, at the end of the day you've gone off the rails at castleford but you've scored an absolute ton of tries and yeah. um why union is it just because sale yeah. came in and interested no it's because i played obviously when i was growing up I, that's what i played oh right Okay. So it was only till I finished school. So when I moved to Melbourne is when I started playing yeah. rugby league. Right. So I I used to play rugby league on a Sunday with my so my I had a good family friend called um, Vea Bloomfield. He was so he sadly passed, and his son called um, Elias. He was like mate, and we went to school together at um, Odu College, and he was like, bro, do you fancy playing league? And I was like, whatever. Like, I'm I'm keen for anything. I was young. I could recover, you yeah. know, straight away. So we were used to play rugby league on the Sunday and first 15 on the Saturday. So that's what kind of, I kind of understood league as well. So when Melbourne came, I was like, yeah, look, I've played it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm keen. Let's go. And then obviously that decision to go back to rugby union was always my, at the back of my mind because that's like my your first calling. love. Mm. It was like, and. Is that the moment you kind of feel like you're being the real Denny? Yeah, because I made the decision for me. Yeah, 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 and not for so, anybody else. Because we've met, not, you've mentioned yeah, not, a few times. It was yeah, not yeah, for my family, not for anyone. Because yeah. I didn't have a, like, my family was halfway around the world. I didn't have to call up my mom and dad. And be like, look, this is what I think. I was twenty one or twenty two, and I need to make a decision for my own life. Mm. So that was kind of like a first stepping stone into finding out who I really am and who I want to be as a man, and. I decided to to make this 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 decision on based on who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. Obviously, it was a lot earlier than I expected, because Castleford. I can't speak about the exact details because I'm you know I've signed a, a, a legal um, paper NDA, say yeah. I couldn't. So, at the time, I asked Castleford for the amount I 
you know, I was rightly probably marketed in any other team. And they point blank, point blank refused. So I said, look, I, I'm going to leave then. You know, this is what's going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'll leave. I'll, I'll find another club. They threatened me, which they did. And I said to them, like, look, that's fine. Like, you know, I'm happy to sign a, a, um, a transfer fee, which I'm sure most teams would have paid for me at the time. And yeah, I mean, fucking out scoring 40 tries a season. I think yeah, everybody would have, yeah. You know, I think the most, I, I didn't think scoring the most tries was my accolade at the, at, on that year. I think it was being in contention for Man of Steel. Really? I think that's what kind of I was just like, fuck. Like, yeah. The only, I've had a, I've had a you know, that's season, yeah. three people out of the whole Super League. I was in there to win the best player that year in Super League. And for me personally, that was the biggest personal accolade that I could have ever, ever had. Like I, you know, a try scoring for me is a team accolade. The left side we had was dangerous. But, you know, put us, put us left edge in any, any team with scoring tries, 100%. Really? We had Junior Moores, Luke Gale, Luke Dawn, and Jake Webster, and me, myself. We're dangerous, man. Like if I was there, if I was their right winger, I'll be I'll be shaking in my boots, man. Really? Like me all I need to do is put the ball down. That was all I needed to do. The brains was Luke Gale and Luke Dawn. The brute force was Junior Moores, Ollie Holmes, and Jake Webster. If you look at the clips, obviously it's all on YouTube. Some tries obviously I have to work for, but most of the tries. Cheap as the boys yeah. done a great job, and that's why I find the try scoring accolade as a team, as a left edge accolade, because without them, I wouldn't have been in that, them situations to even put the ball down. Yeah. You've um you've talked a bit in the past about um contracts, stats on the pitch. They're just mm. kind of a number in the business. Yeah, yeah. What did you want to be though? As in what? Well, it, it from that kind of that statement. I, I'm just a I'm just a number in the business. I mean, what, what yeah. did you expect? What did what did you want to be? I, I wanted to be the one man club. I thought Melbourne right. was going to be the one club I stay at. I'm going to be the next Billy Slater that you know comes through the ranks. They're going to put a a statue outside of the stadium for the amount of services I've done for the club. That's what I expected. Okay. And that's what I expected. And that's probably why it hit me harder, mm. not having an opportunity to even do that. And then come in Carlsford, exact same. I was like, jeepers, this is great. This is going to be like, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my stamp here and they're going to remember me forever. And now instead of remembering me for a good thing, they remember yeah. me for the most horrible thing that to do. But in any scenario, if some business came to poach you as, as, a, as an employee, would you ever let down an income that could provide for you for the rest of the life? No, but it's only because I'm, and the way it kind of got portrayed into the papers is that I'm this bad guy, but I'm just mm. another, I'm just another cow on the, the conveyor belt that's just yeah, ready yeah. for slaughter. Mm. But if you flip it and if a company was to do what I did to them, they'd be like, oh, it's just business, great business, you know, get, um, you know, 250,000 for Denny and you buy five other players. That's great business. But, oh, jeepers, my phone's going to die. Um, but for for me personally, it was just a personal attack. Like, I'm this bad guy. And it kind how long of... Have we got, how long have we got until your phone dies? No, you're all right. We're, we're all good. It kind of like... I'll just charge it anyway. Um, oh. we're, we're only in the middle of this story, my friend. No, oh, here <laughs> we go. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just like... That that whole thing of that social media, which I find very horrible now, is that it's the drive for for personal attacks. And I was reading mm -hmm. Twitter like day in day out, the, the words that have said I was living them, I was feeling them. Snake, C word, um, you know, Judas. What did, what did that do to you? It fucked me up mentally, really, because my mental state wasn't good at all. Anyway to even start with 
but then to add this whole pressure of all these people that probably I've met, but not really paid attention to, and I probably won't even see again. No, nor but do because, you know. Exactly. But because of all these people saying all these things, it was like it was a personal attack. Like I, I knew him. It was like my family was saying that to me. That's how I took it. And then fortunate enough, I had a great season at Sale. I ended up scoring tries. I ended up debuting that same year. And this is what people struggle to understand, is that how can I have had a 40-plus try scoring season, a man of steel contention, but feel the way I feel? Still suffering from like, depression. Exactly. And I was like, this is not something that just goes away. This is not something that you can just magically kick your fingers, take a pill, take a drink, and it goes away. Like, I struggled with it by myself for the how last do you de- how, how do you describe your depression? Because a, a lot of people that I come on, come on to this podcast, they can describe it relatively succinctly and express it, and others can't. It's this, like, out-of-body experience a lot of the time. But yeah. how, how would you describe the, the feeling of depression which ran throughout, I, I'd probably say, from 20 to 24? It's like, it's like th- four or five years. It's, it's, it's yeah. a long time. Uh, yeah I think I'll be the one of the guys that said it was like an out of body experience like it was just I can't put a finger on why I was feeling it and that's what I didn't understand is like why was I feeling so sad and so miserable Mm. when the world was at my feet scoring tries winning games basically the whole rugby league community knew who I was and that's always that's all what I wanted for that's literally the fame that I've wanted to make sure everyone that anyone that got mentioned like my last name Solomon anyone that said that last name that they will know who I was and why was I feeling so sad why was I feeling like I needed to drink my life away why was I feeling like I needed to put a hole through my nostrils <laughs> it, 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 it baffles me even to even think about it now is because if you meet me now. Yeah, yeah, different person. It's like, it's like, are how you do you sure reflect back on it? Person? Obviously, I've, it's, it's a big journey. It was a very, big, big very, journey. very, very big journey. And it was a um, crippling journey at the same. Like, it was like, obviously, times were that tough that I was you know, attempting to try and commit suicide because mm. it was, it was horrible. I, mm. And that, I think that's what was making it worse is because I knew I had a great life, but then at the same time, this feeling inside me was eating me up. I was like, man, I was totally the same. And you feel, and, I felt, I felt this like a uh, indomitable sense of guilt and shame and burden yeah. constantly. Yeah. yeah even though I was looking at myself like, okay, yeah, I've went to a private school. Like I've got <laughs> like lived in a five bedroom. My parents live in a five bedroom house, two dogs, great girlfriend, yeah. like great friends, but it doesn't matter. I was, I was in a, in a place where, do you know what? I could have jumped off that off Putney bridge. No problem. No, literally Pretty, no problem. Yeah, I agree. And that's the exact same as for me is that there's this, and it's still there. It's still here. I still have it like really? every now and then. And what's fortunate for me is now was me and Holly. Holly's great. She, yeah, yeah. And when I was talking with Ollie before, uh, the, the guy of some savior world mm. kind of made me realize like people come into your life for different reasons. It's either a lesson or you got to, you know, obviously you, that's your person. And when I learned all of this whole, self-worth um you know mental health obviously learning more in depth about it um and just creeping down the rabbit hole is the more i learned about ego about everything else and how to stay connected and stay woke basically how i know it's a bit cringe because everyone's like this whole thing but as cliche as it is there's people that are still sleeping there's still people mm. that have clicked this autopilot in their mind and they're just going about business, going about their, their nine to five job, go back home. You know, that's, that's all they do. But 
he's officially woke me up to the way I feel, how to in tune the way I feel and how to deal with it now. And uh, okay. Um, that's interesting. And part, part of the kind of, I suppose the mantra of this podcast is obviously we explore how you, how, how the fuck you got into your ruck, like, <laughs> yeah. rut, sorry, what it was like being there, which we've kind of done at length as yeah. well, which has been fascinating. And also how, how on earth you got out of it and you, you have got out of it, albeit there are moments where, yeah, for, for me, sometimes during the day, a th- suicidal thought will creep into my head and yeah. I'm like, Oh, hello. Um, you're back. And like, that's yeah. normalized for me. And that's something I accept. But for you, yeah. what was the process of getting out of your rut? Like moving away from booze, moving away uh, from Coke, like, and then, and then obviously it sounds like sale and Steve Diner have been amazing, but what's been that process of learning self-worth? How did you do it? Cry. <laughs> really? Cry. Yeah. Um, obviously there's this whole persona around crying. It's like, males don't cry men don't cry men mm. emotions and men is is not a <laughs> it doesn't go it's not one plus one you know that's yeah. what people think and all ollie basically first probably the first three meetings i've had with ollie it was just crying constant crying and trying to f- dig deep and find find the pain live in it breathe in it actually accept the pain for who you are because if you if because I'm constantly neglecting this pain, it's the reason why we're feeling the way we are. I'm just running. If I accept it, right? this pain, exactly. If I head straight for this pain, live in it, breathe in it, you're gonna. I'm gonna accept it, and it's gonna accept me, and it's gonna identify that it's okay to sometimes feel sad. It's okay to sometimes wake up, and on a perfectly beautiful day, and feel like you want to absolutely ruin yourself. But, and that's where we get out of our rut, but that's the perfect thing is because, because you're so in tune with it, it helps you be like, okay, so I have Mick Farrell as a, as a team psychologist at our club at the minute. I've got a perfect support network around me now that as soon as the day I even wake up and feel like that, it's instantly nipped in the bud, just, just instantly done. spoken to. I'm, really? You know, sometimes it doesn't happen until I get home and I've had a tough day on my feet. You know, something has annoyed me at training. Get home. I just ask Holly, I said, can you just cuddle me? Or I just snuggle up to my, my little girl. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how much it has changed from even like, and now I can actually drink and not black out. I can actually drink and just You've got a better enjoy, relationship with alcohol and enjoy the taste of an alcohol instead of this, this is a, a Jack Daniels. This is a, yeah. a wine bottle. Like it doesn't even, I didn't even care at the time. As long yeah. as it got me drunk, I didn't care. That's going now, down too. Yeah. And that's what, and now it's just, it's amazing because it was identifying the pain, the source of the pain, the reason why, I was feeling depressed, which was like we go back to the identity and because mm. I was thought and the pressures that rug, it came with rugby that it put on myself and I put on myself. Um, and so that was my pain. That was a source of everything because I didn't deal with it then just because I didn't say, Dad, can, you, like, can we just ease up? Can we just have a chill? Can we have a chat? Can, can you kind of just chat me through this? I did it all on my own. And that's the thing, that's what I hate that I, if I was to go back, I wish I did. Which is why the loose I, message has resonated so much with you. Yeah. And, and let's, yeah. let's just constantly talk about it. it yeah, especially in rugby is because that's mm. who I was. Mm. And I'm in the works of doing my own now as well. So I'm okay. gonna open up and we're gonna go to, you know, academies, you know, training camps, you know, when clubs open up training camps to, you know, some parents just drop their kids off because they want a, a, a day off. Yeah. It'll be aimed at, at kids coming through rugby, going to schools, going to sports schools. Um, and we're going to, I'm going to start obviously opening up a bit more in my experience just to hopefully help the next generation or the next me, 
the next 15 year old that is coming through that I can hopefully help. Because, you know, if I can help one, one little kid oh, might 100%. save his life. And so that for me personally, that's what's in the works now. And obviously from me getting out of it now, I found that rainbow at the end of the storm, which is my little family, Holly and, and Rue. How long did it take? And what, getting out of it fully? Well, yeah, this process, because some people it takes a couple of Super. years, other people it's like, Jesus, right, we've had four therapy sessions, and you know what, I'm, I'm in a great place now. I, to be fair, I think it was at least six months it took me, but it was a hard, hard, hard mm. six months. Like I was saying, the first four sessions, I was just crying. You know, and that's what people need to understand is that it's not, it's not an easy road. No. You, you don't just look at me and be like, oh, okay, he can get through it. But it's, it's easy. It's going to take a lot of work individ- like for yourself. Like, you, you know, this, this is what I've always said. Like, no one can do the work for you. Everyone can hold your hand through that journey. Mm but no one else can do that inner work for you. You've got mm-hmm. to wake up with yourself because no one else is going to wake up with you and constantly be there. But you have to do the inner work for yourself. You've got to choose to go through that pain before you get to the other end. What so advice do you, pain... what, what, what advice do you think? Sorry to interrupt, but like, what, what advice do you, do, would you give to like a younger Denny or, or a 15 year old kid growing up who's the next Denny Solomona at that age? Um, obviously, ego is probably going to be one of them. Identify what your ego is at the minute, sort it out, make sure you work in tune with that, and just be patient with yourself. Like, obviously, don't be so hard. I was like, everything, when you grow up, everything needs to be a certain way. Like your parents, like you need to go to school, you need to do this, you need to do that. Sometimes it's just taking a step back, having a day off and just being like, look, like actually look at your life from a third person and just be like, this is, just be, just love yourself, be patient. If things don't go your way, don't let it get to you so much because that's what I feel like. What, which was lucky is that younger kids now are getting more in tune with their feelings. And that's what I found with doing these workshops is that I found that they're, they're a lot more better than obviously us olders is that they're happy to speak to their parents now. I think it's that kind of side of things has changed a lot. And mm. nowadays they're happy to speak about their feelings, which is great, which is obviously the first step to obviously stopping this and preventing this is that speaking is probably the best thing. So yeah, my advice is obviously speak and be patient and just love yourself. I think that's the biggest one is, is, is love yourself. Be, be easy on yourself. Time's going to get tough. It's not your fault. You don't purposely go and ruin, ruin whatever situation you're going to be in. And that's probably my number one. You've also got quite an interesting insight into like Samoan culture, right? Because yeah. from the Islanders that come and play in the Premiership, but all around the world, um, Samo- a Pacific Island culture is something which um, is, it, it's not very secular in the sense that it's, it's, it's got faith that it's underpinned by faith, right? And yeah. I can imagine for your family listening or, or reading daily mail article or listening to you speak to them about your problems, that might've been quite a tough, um, tough thing for them to go through given the whole um, culture within the Pacific Islanders around talking, but being respectful and, and not wanting yeah. to show weakness, etc. cetera. What, what was it like? Uh, it was actually obviously daunting because I didn't know how they were going to take it. Um, mm. Sorry. Good night, my love. Love oh, you. I'm, I feel awful. I've... <laughs> no, it's okay. She's just going to bed. Good night, my Good night, Rue. <laughs> yeah. She's in there. She'd be naughty. Mwah, love you. Um. Yeah, it was obviously daunting because, and that's the, uh, go, we go back to the way 
you know, the conflict of feelings is because why am I, why did I feel so bad when I have this amazing family mm. or, and why do I feel like it wasn't my family's fault at all, but it was the pressure that came with it. If that makes sense. It was like that whole, essentially the family was, it was, it was the reason why, but my family actually wasn't is because I put the pressure on myself thinking cool. of my family your experience of, of how yeah, you, you live yeah. through life. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, like you said, faith it underpins my faith in, in God and religion. And we put, we put full faith in, in God that he provides the way he paves the way. And just like all the islanders before me, that have paved the way for me in the prem. It's probably, you know, we, we, it's the hardest thing is because it only takes till now. And, you know, you can see on Twitter now that the fight for Pacific Islanders and equal rights within the rugby. Mm. Uh, and I don't want to go into depth into that because it's just a whole new story. Oh, but yeah. I literally just, yet yeah, last night I watched Dan yeah. Leo's new film. Yeah. yeah. Which is a part cracking. And, and that's, that's, that's the exact reason is because really? it's not just our family. It's obviously some boys have the whole country on their shoulders mm. and you can imagine how much pressure that creates and that's the sort of troubles we kind of face is that if we don't change this whole like obviously the whole culture doesn't have to change but the whole culture of having to rely on your bottom feeding the top which is your you know everyone feeding upwards, giving money back home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where we can change that culture and make sure that the generation that plays the rugby now gets paid and sets themselves up so that their next generation, their mm -hmm. family, their kids grow up, that they don't have the pressure to have money, to play, to play sport, to have money. They can just play sport to enjoy the sport they can be like, oh, okay, I'm not financially like struggling. I don't have to find what I'm, what I love to turn it into something of a job. So I don't have to go out and find money straight away. I can then find myself, my identity, who I am mm -hmm. and go from there. You know, and that's the culture we live in. Like, although I love my culture, I'm, you know, I'm proud to be Samoan. But that's the sort of things we need to change is that we need to change the generation now to then come further on in the line is that we don't have any other Islanders that struggle a lot with it. And most struggles with Islanders and mental health is because of the pressures that they put on themselves because they've got family, the feedback home. How big a problem is it? Mental health with an island? It's massive. Islanders. Really? Massive, massive, massive. Throughout my time here in London, in England, there's been about four or five islander young boys that take their lives back home in the, in Australia with the NRL, and Shocking. that's that's from what I know. That's from who I know as well. And I lost a really close friend of mine through that as well. Mm, sorry to hear that. God. Yeah, so it's and that's how bad it is. Obviously. It's bad. I'm not saying it's a it's a it's a it's a race that's struggling with it the most. Say for the purposes of no, of course, the pressure that it comes with is because the rugby rugby in yeah. in Tonga, Fiji, yes. Samoa yes. is is the the national sport. Uh, yeah. It's it's just yeah. you 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 go one of two ways really. With and watching Dan Leo's film last night, it really hit home you really do go one or two ways if you want to be a rugby player from the yeah. the islands it's you either go and get a contract in new zealand or australia or in europe or yeah. you try and um you try and work what well, you try and work your way through in 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 samoa like yeah but it doesn't off it, do, it rarely ever happens that way no it's because first you're going to find someone that will pay you a flight like yeah. we're not the richest country we're not we're people that still grow veg back garden we're still people that you know live on trading like we 
it's still like that back home, back in Samoa, back in Tonga, back in Fiji. And obviously Fiji might be a bit more fortunate. They've got beautiful islands, beautiful resorts. So, but obviously it doesn't go into the, a sole singular person that wants to be a rugby player. Mm. So the struggles is all still there because, yeah, it is only two ways. It's either you get like Semi Rajaraja, for, for as an example. You know, he came straight from Fiji, went straight into Par- um, Parramatta Eels, had a killer of a season, and that's how they know him because he went from Parramatta. But where was yeah. he before? Oh. A kid in Fiji, like that, yeah. that's what he was. Mm. But same as Rupeni South, 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 South yeah, yeah. I mean, like yeah. that story is so it's yeah. brutal. I mean, he was yeah. he was genuinely one of the best players in the world. Like yeah. that 2003 World Cup where he tore it to he's shreds. A freak. He was a freak, yeah. and now look at him. He's like he, there's n- he's got nothing, genuinely yeah. nothing. I, yeah. I was watching that film. I was like, how how has this even happened? But again, exactly. it's, 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 we could do a whole other pod. Uh, maybe yeah. we should do a whole other pod. Yeah, um, okay. Let's, let's do it. Do it. Um, yeah, I, uh, it's it's a savage world. Yeah, it is, and you know, I'm I'm glad to have lived my experiences and have that sort of knowledge to then pass on and like you know mm. people like you that we are grateful for because you guys are also spreading the awareness through your podcast and you're also another living you know breathing example of there's always light at the end of the tunnel and it's not it's not just pain it's also beauty you can also mm. turn it into a positive thing because if you're also struggling you you speak to your missus she can also mm. be struggling as well mm. and i feel like that that's the beautiful thing about this whole movement that we're, we're doing that we can actually make this what seems to be a negative persona as a as a positive thing that we can all go through for me and mental health do. denny like i don't know how about you but for me mental health there, there's especially in men there is so much more more understanding and education that needs to be done that's what i'm really seeing at the moment a yeah. lot of a lot of my friends who've never experienced depression, anxiety, or mental illness, mental health problems, they're like, "What's it like?" And I'm like, <laughs> "I'm like, fuck, it's so bad." Yeah. Um, like me personally, because I went into England, and it was my first time. I've not played rugby for long, or professional rugby for long. I was this new kid on the block. My anxiety levels was crazy. It's like starting really? a new school jumping straight into like, let's say you were in year eight, you had all your friends and you just get plucked out of that year eight class and put into another school across the world and with another group of year eights. And they're like, sort yourself out. That was my anxiety level. Like, it was through the roof. Like, and even throughout training, like, it was just crazy. Crazy, crazy, because I thought I was always late for something. I thought I was mm. not where I was supposed to be. You know, and obviously I was just this outsider. Of what I had. This is how I felt. I was just this outsider coming into a group of guys that have been together since England under 18s, England under 20s, and now obviously open England. And that's, I just thought that I was just this outsider that was just coming in. And my anxiety levels was crazy because I just thought, what if they're thinking this? What if they're thinking that? And yeah, it is, it's anxiety is also another crippler. It just does you. It does. You just overthink. So yeah, no, I agree with you. I think everything needs to be still, still got a long way to go, but we've made Huge, massive progress. Massive progress recently. Uh, know, I've got five like questions for thing. you to finish actually. Yeah. Um, number one, what's your favorite book and why? Uh, Alchemist. And the reason why is because a lot of things in there resonated with my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, The whole journey through the the desert storm was my journey through my loneliness. Um, Finding, you know, what what he was saying, the Messiah that was kind of around in the camp was the guy that I kind of, my my Mick Farrell, my Ollie, my loose heads, my my Mrs. Holly now is that my Messiah, my guy that I, that, is there constantly for me. I don't need to talk to them, you know, every day, but I know if I was to ever text Mick, he's there. Yeah. So that's the reason why that's my favorite book. That's nice. I really like, I'm going to read that actually. I've yeah, heard, I've heard book. good things about that. Yeah. Um, 
Number two, and this, I get really interesting uh, answers to this one. Uh, what lesson have you learned in your life that you kind of, you know is true, but you kind of hate? Lesson in life? That you know is true, but you kind of hate. <laughs> oh, I'm a big introvert. Really? Uh, uh, yeah, so obviously uh, <laughs> my, my missus, she hates it. And I hate, I hate it as well because I because I'm such a home bird. Mm. And if I was to make a plan with someone and say, yeah, 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 come around or let's, let's go, I'll come around to yours, come to the time of going or getting them in. I'm like, oh, Fuck. not just like make <laughs> yeah. an excuse and we can just chill. That's, yeah, that's the biggest like thing for me. I'm like a that. big introvert. Yeah. I found, um, I found uh, this new sense of, I suppose, introversy, if that's even a word might be. Yeah. Um, in lockdown, lockdown, the amount of time I was forced to spend by myself and also my missus. And I was like, fuck, okay, yeah, no, this is actually quite fun. <laughs> quite like yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm exactly the same. So lockdown, like everyone was like, oh, lockdown was horrible. I had, to, you know, I had to spend time with my missus. I was like, I was like, oh, am I the only one that really enjoyed yeah. <laughs> being at home, <laughs> winning at Monopoly, of course? <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. Question number three: Your friend who's having a tough time at the moment picks up the phone. He rings you and says he's having a really bad day today. What do you say? I either say I'm coming over or come mm. come to mine. Okay. Or if he says no, I'm still going over. Nice. Okay, good. I, I like I like those these. There's two questions here in the middle around mental health, yeah. which um, often do you know what if you if you condense this podcast into the last five questions that I'll ask, it, it helps a lot of people in itself. Um, oh, question number four, when you're struggling with something, you're struggling yourself, what's your go-to? What do you do to improve things? Me personally, I, it's sitting there. Obviously, if you've got these, these breathing apps, breathe, identify, the stress or the anxiety or the, the sadness that you feel and sit with it and understand it because the more understanding you have of that struggle, the more options you can see yourself doing. Whether if, let's say, if it's, you know, stress from work, what is it in work that's making you stress? Can you do something to help yourself? Is it maybe just getting a bit more active to help your mind sleep at night? so that when you go to work you're not as tired is it so different things if you can sit with the pain sit with the struggle you'll then identify what you need to do throughout this process whether it's step by step whether it's just one thing you need to change throughout your life whether it's a diet maybe eating healthier food so that what you put in your body is helping you mentally helping you sleep better because sleep is also another big thing some people mm -hmm cannot sleep and that's why they're waking up like horrible have a bad day at work then that, that cycle is just constantly repeating itself so yeah sit with it breathe identify the, the pain or the struggle you, you're going through and 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 from that naturally you'll find a a solution if it's obviously a lot worse then it's definitely pick up the phone call talk the best it. mate and mm -hmm. talk nice number five I reckon I know the answer to this one. You're lying on the on your deathbed, looking back at your life. What are you yeah. most proud of? <laughs> my family. Yeah, I thought my so. My family, my my little girl. Um, yeah, it's it it, it, te it tears me up now. But the way Holly is with my daughter, the way we've kind of just the little things she does for her and for my, my myself, this house. She's like literally the pillar of this house. And that's what I'm, what I'm really grateful for. And obviously the gratitude that I have for her and my, my little girl as well. So yeah, definitely my family. Beautiful. Um, any, uh, any more on the horizon? I hope so. I hope yeah. so. Uh, hoping for a little lad. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, Fucking I hell, another Denny Solomon. Jesus. Yeah, mate. <laughs> I hope, I hope, because... Uh, the girl upstairs is literally my little mate. So mm. I think my, my missus wants a, um, you know, a, a mummy's boy. Mm. So hopefully I can give her a mummy's boy because she's definitely a daddy's girl upstairs. 
Denny, we've done an almost an hour and forty five minutes. Man, I could have I could have gone on. It's, this is um, easy. <laughs> that's good. I, I I'm hoping we can do a a a, a rut episode two with uh, Denny Solomon yeah. and dive deep into definitely Simone culture and more into mental health at some stage in the future. Yeah. But thank you so much for coming on. No, mate. I, I thank you very much for, for even thinking of inviting me onto your podcast. And, uh, you know, like I said, I love what you're doing. No, I, uh, I saw the daily mail article and I was like, this guy's got it relatively sussed <laughs> and he'd be great to, to chat about. So, uh, but cheers, look, you're, thank you're, you. uh, you're, a uh, inspiration a role model to god knows how many young kids are, who are growing up watching sale and and your ability to articulate and talk about your problems the way you have both mm. in the media and on this podcast and whatever you do in the future is just absolutely phenomenal so thank you Paul. Hats Cheers, off to man. You, i appreciate the great words thank you.